So this is the first lecture for the mobile research class. And the class is a little bit different to your typical setup. And we have, um, we have two, um, two courses, two specialization courses. One is in mobile and distributed tech, and one is in games. Who of you is doing the games also with Simon? Um, so those of you who are doing both, uh, you will kind of experience two styles of debating. In Simon's course, you will have to speak and present your arguments in a verbal form. In this course, you will be asked to do the same, but in written form. So this course um, focuses on argumenting and arguing for a particular case or particular point of view using a written format, right? So in this course, you will be asked to write short essays and then counter argue somebody else's point by writing a short essay, right? So you either write your own point and kind of argue for it or, or and defend it, or you will be arguing against somebody else's point by pointing out some weak spots or some uh, illogical arguments or bringing up evidence which kind of doesn't support the claim that somebody else is making, okay? So we do that using kind of a um, in-house built tool um, and you kind of write the essays in a, yeah, just textual format. And then other students can see that and um, uh, counter argue for them, okay? So we have sort of a three forms of expression. One is the essay itself. Uh, one is the counter argument for somebody else's essay, saying, okay, you're wrong because. And then the third one is just a review, kind of a neutral review of the quality of the uh, original essay. We're not reviewing the counter arguments, but we will be reviewing the, the original essays. Uh, the essays don't have to be very long, uh, but you have to make a point. So you have to describe what your point is and bring some evidence kind of supporting the point. Um, uh, how, what, what is the theme? Well, the theme is quite open, right? So we, in this course, we're covering mobile technology, distributed technology, cloud technology, wearables, anything to do with sort of a modern, um, yeah, modern technologies, broadly speaking, right? Um, so I have sort of an empty page um, and if you, if you kind of uh, think for a moment what is what the mobile development, what the mobile and cloud developments kind of are, we can list the topics that are sort of the, the broad categorization of the space that we're dealing with, okay? So the first exercise is to have some sort of a high level points of what it is that we can pot potentially discuss in this course, right? Um, to give you an example, you know, uh, uh, a mobile cloud connectivity and efficiency of where to run some processes on the cloud and when to run some processes in the mobile is one of those topics, right? So for example, performance of cloud versus mobile computing is potentially one of the topics. Uh, so take, you know, a few minutes and think what are the other topics that we can discuss, okay? So then once we do that, once, once we have a kind of a categories, what we will do is we will search for papers which kind of are fitting within those categories. And we will look at problems which people are dealing with, okay? Again, it's slightly different to the way specialization in games works because the papers and the topics are kind of given to you, okay? I want for this course, I, I want those two courses to be slightly different, right? So we don't repeat the same thing. So for two, like if a, a student is taking both courses, you will not have the same sort of pattern. You will have complementary patterns, right? So in this course, we first try to identify the topics jointly uh, as a group, and then we will kind of search and fill in the papers which fit in recent you know, innovations which fit in for those topics. What we will do next is we will pick, you know, each of you will pick three topics uh, different ones, we try to mix so then the topics don't kind of repeat and you will write three essays within those topics saying, okay, I believe this is true, okay? 
and then you will do the same for the for the counter argument so each of you will write six pieces it will be three um, three essays one counter argument and two reviews okay uh, so in total you will write about 25 pages of stuff with those six things right so in games, if you're doing games, you will have to write a report, which will again be, you know, between 15 to 25 pages long. Here you will write the same thing, but on six different things, right? So you'll write much shorter pieces, but in total you will kind of write similar amount. Uh, and you will not argue verbally, you will only argue in writing, okay? Why? Okay, we are kind of investigating or trying to learn how to prepare kind of a, a good written argument and how to defend it and how to read papers and see weak spots okay so some papers which i will suggest for some of the topics will be kind of faulty by default okay it, it's sort of easy or maybe not easy to see why the conclusions are not logically derived from the premises the paper claims to have right um, so kind of being able to spot that is kind of one skill and then being able to formulate your own arguments and then derive kind of uh, conclusions from it is another skill. It will come really handy next year and also when you're writing your thesis to sort of formulate your argumentation this way, right? Any questions so far? Great, so five minutes, Google, you know, search, check what topics we can specify which would fit for that course okay for now we just let's say i, I put one uh, and then we we see how how it goes All right, so we have one mobile cloud interoperability, interoperability and performance, and then think and propose other areas or high-level topics that we can group under a single umbrella for further kind of investigations. Of course, this exercise is a little bit um, hand wavy because you can do it in different ways, right? You can pick different uh, ca categories, different uh, dimensions of how you're going to divide the space, right? We can say, okay, something to do with cloud and something to do with mobile. It's one kind of categorization. We can do something to do with security, something to do with scalability, something to do with mobility, right? You can pick different dimensions and then organize things along those dimensions. So we're not doing like a proper taxonomy, we're just sort of highlighting a general topics that kind of occur within the space to have some sort of map, but it doesn't have to be a properly defined taxonomy, right? It's, it's sort of more of a mind map. Can you do something like scalability or, uh, or scalability? Like when this... Um and this communication costs yeah. so it starts hurting the scalability of the system so that they're scaling you're scaling up a certain cloud system yeah. and then they have to communicate and that sort of starts being a bottleneck okay Is that the theme or yep it can so let's say scalability uh, billing and performance yeah. right so that's fine it overlaps a little bit with the first one right so you, you, you see this one more from the cost perspective, right? Or not necessarily? No, I'm thinking in the communication part, sort of yep. that, you know, the nodes have to be communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. And when does that start hurting the, uh, uh, the actual process so that you should you know, scale down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's more like... Uh, 
yeah yep good so then then it doesn't really um so the first one is more what you're supposed to do on the cloud and what you're supposed to do on the thin devices on the client side uh and how you balance the performance this way this one is more focusing on the oops on the actual communication okay. yeah that's fine yep yeah, we can add infrastructure here. Yeah, what else? So those two are quite uh, narrow, right? They could be under the same umbrella, so to speak. You can say, okay, we have, uh, you know, um, so if I say, Scalability and performance, those two would kind of fit under, right? So what else? Yeah? Like uh, battery or energy management? Energy management, perfect. Yeah, so on some and um, it's one of the topics we, but there, there is more under the energy umbrella right we did have discussed last year some of the techniques for conserving energy some of the software development practices of how to make the uh, battery lasting longer uh, there were papers, for example, uh, from the energy consumption, whether doing something on the mobile is better than shifting the data to the cloud, doing it in the cloud and shifting the results back. And the, you have to trade off the battery consumption for the communication versus the battery consumptions for the processing, right? If doing the processing is cheaper on the mobile, you should do it on the mobile. But if doing the processing drains your battery more than sending the data, data over, you should send the data over, right? So it was not zero-sum game. It was just shifting, like, you know, it was assuming that the cloud energy comes for free, sort of. It, it's not, drain, you know, affecting the battery, right? In, in reality, it's a zero-sum game. You cannot use less energy than it's needed. In fact, by sending it over there, doing it there, and sending it back, you're using more energy than just doing it on the phone. But you're not draining the battery, right? So the battery will last longer. So we, we had some some discussions about that last last semester uh, last year. Yeah, that's a good one. What else? <coughs> Perfect. So we can say wearables in general, and then under the wearables uh, security threats and risks could also be privacy maybe right what else user interface perfect so ux ui um in general um you could do it sort of a uh, mobile specific but you can do it for other use cases like you know how you do ux ui on wearables how you deal with the watch uis um so we did have we did have some papers last year about that uh we were discussing for example um various uh technologies for assisting typing Right, so there was a, a paper which we discussed last year. Is it more efficient to have gestures which are editable shortcuts or whether doing everything the way we kind of do it right now is more efficient, right? So like, let's say you are editing a text message or an email on the mobile phone. So you're kind of editing it and then you need to delete the word. So you have to place the cursor at the end of the word and press delete a few times you know to delete it and then when you want to um, do something else you have to like click 
like you need to fix uh, a letter somewhere again you have to find the place put the cursor there and so on so it's a little bit tedious and a little bit time consuming to do that manually but you can have a gestures which are like delete the word right so no matter where the cursor is on that word you can do the gesture and the word just disappears right so you can have some help in kind of editing your your text and there was some research done of which one is more efficient of course there is a learning curve so the, the users have to learn the gestures right um, so the, the paper was a little bit um, um, it wasn't perfect because the people like it's kind of comparing apples and oranges like people are quite skilled in placing the cursors and kind of doing the normal thing if they have to use the gestures they have to look up okay what the gesture was right so they had some cards and uh, which were kind of uh, showing them what the gesture was to kind of use it but you know that's kind of imperfect it sort of favors the normal users a little bit more you could have an experiment where you uh, let the users learn the gestures and then become more efficient with them and then compare the normal users with those but then you have the you know the learning curve issue right uh, so it, it is kind of hard so you know you ux ui usually is quite hard to get kind of a conclusive uh, remarks you have to really think through how you do structure experiments but yeah so so we did something like that so we, it was kind of um, in the context of text editing uh, but that's really specific right it's like you know uh, third level of specificity um, so what else what else on the high level we can put and what else we can fit in into various things that we have we Yes, we can. So you can have um, VR specific. What other wearables are you using? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm using um, a smartwatch, which tracks my activities and my heart rate and my temperature and. When I go for running or swimming, I use like a chest strap also, which monitors more de detailed the heart rate. Uh, what what other wearables you know about or you use? Yep. Yep. You have a Garmin as well. Um, any of you use like the sleep bands for EEG? Um, there are some smart vests which are kind of doing what the watches are doing but they know a little bit more uh, because they have more more sensors built in um, there are some technologies where you can use uh, in a car so you can plug in an app or a device which monitors you know fuel consumption and acceleration and different things related to your car um, uh, yeah, it's not really wearable. It's like wearable for a car. Um, okay, so what else? What else do you think we can place there? What would interest you? Like, what would you like to kind of read up on and, and learn more? Or what was recently on the news or, you know? Security is a big one. So we have security under wearables, but you know, uh, security for mobiles is kind of uh, relevant too, right? So we could um, we could elevate that to actually we could elevate both to a top level category. Um, and say it this way right um, there was so yesterday there was a, an article about the patching of the um, 
meltdown and spectre uh, uh, vulnerabilities on the mobile platforms and the situation is terrible <laughs> because the, they are basically not doing it. So Google was doing it for the Nexus line of phones, but it only affects the Nexus phones with the latest security patch from January the 5th. All the other Android platforms are still kind of vulnerable uh, to exploits using the Meltdown and Spectre. Um, yeah? Of some, some trade-offs between security and performance? Or? Yeah. yeah. So I would put it here, right? So I would say... Um, security. security, yeah. Yeah. So that's true. Uh, most of the patches have to hinder the performance, um, unfortunately, but yeah. There was a, an interesting uh, talk I, I, I've seen uh, towards the end of last year which was about the power button so you know the power button of the old pcs was a physical switch which was turning off the um uh, the uh, transformer of the electricity so you could basically flip the switch and the power was cut off to your motherboard right so it was a physical connection between the switch and the uh, the trans transformer which was using the uh, uh, you know the variable current to the st st uh, stable current so nowadays this physical switch doesn't exist it's all software driven right so your power buttons are kind of software driven uh, to a point where sometimes it's like a, the power management system is so complicated that it's like a mini OS right it can have its own exploits and its own security flaws um, so we we sort of see like software going everywhere where it can even to places which used to be physical things and physical kind of uh, devices right it's the same with tickets like uh, you know tickets used to be a piece of paper you go to a concert or to a cinema and you have a piece of paper but it is kind of disappearing like you you see just uh, you know you go to, to Trondheim and you have this app which gives you a ticket on the phone and that's it. You don't have anything physical anymore, right? So this kind of a trans, um, transformation of physical things into software is kind of happening. And I think it is relevant to the, to the course too. But it sort of doesn't really, like it's, it's, it doesn't exist as a kind of a theme, right? Like we see that, we see that's happening, this kind of transformation, but it's kind of hard to capture it as a sort of a theme. Um, but, you know, sometimes you, you see articles like software is eating the world, things like this, right? Uh, they, they, a, a little bit like conspiracy theory <laughs> or something that, you know, uh, but it's not about that. It's about, um, it's about convenience and it's about control and about automation, right? If tickets are physical items, then humans have to somehow print it, something, you know, physical has to happen. But if something is being put into software, then it's so much easier to automate it and to control it and to, to kind of manage that. So um, I, I would put some sort of a theme at the top, which is, um, uh, let's say, software replacing physical artifacts yep. but you, you know what I'm what I'm getting at here right uh, and it is it is kind of relevant because mobile allowed a lot of those things to happen right so you know payments like how often do you really use cash these days very little. Uh, you have mobile payments, you have uh, debit cards and, and so on, you have kind of electronic payments and in developed countries like in Norway I, I actually almost never touch cash uh, 
I could, it's, it's fine, as a lot of people do for privacy reasons and, and so on, right? Um, but you don't have to. It, it has been sort of replaced to a point where some countries are considering like completely getting rid of cash, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, the topic about getting rid of cash is not a technology question. It's more of an ethical and moral and political question, right? Because technologically, we can do that. But a lot of people would say, yeah, but, you know, how about our privacy? How about our right to spend money and nobody knows what we spent it on, right? Uh, cash gives you that ability. And then if we all go to only electronic payments, then someone tracks everything, right? Someone knows who paid for what. Uh, and then you lose this ability for paying anonymously. But, you know, maybe with blockchain technology or with some modern cryptocurrencies, you can still have that, right? It's electronic and anonymous, right? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, but payments and, and crypto is, again, a kind of a, a different topic, right? Um, yeah. Yep, that's that's a good one. We had that last year as well. So um, so let's say let's call it e health, m health, p health. You know those all those acronyms. So what's what's e health? Electronic health, electronic health records. It's all about uh, making. Uh, records electronic, right? Um, I actually don't know how it is in Norway. I, I don't use doctors that much, but in New Zealand, the health records were kept in a file. It was like a folder, and your GP had that folder, and you go there, and they have this kind of a printed folder of all the visits and all the uh, vaccinations and all things that happened to you. And then if you want to change the GP, you go to your GP and you say, I, I will be changing the GP. So they will give you that folder. You take it and you take it to a, a new GP, right? And then if you go to a hospital, the hospital calls your GP and the GP kind of gives the folder to the doctor in a hospital, right? So it was actually like a physical piece of documentation. Um, and it is, I, I think it's similar in Poland too, right? So there is so, some sort of a physical thing that you carry between doctors. So for example, you go to, a, to do your blood test you get the blood test done, they will give you a kind of a results, the printed raw data, you take it, and then you go to a doctor, you give it to a doctor, and then the doctor will give you the sort of uh, summary, right? Um, yeah, so uh, eHealth is all about, okay, let's get rid of paper, let's make everything electronic, and let's make those health records being exchanged between the stakeholders in a safe and secure manner, right? Um, mHealth. So mobile health, uh, it's all about wearables and all, uh, it's not actually about wearables, the p-health is more about wearables. m-health is more about being able to communicate with the doctor over distance, right? So like you have, um, you are sick and instead of you going physically to a doctor, you can kind of use technology to assist your, um, um, yeah, so, so the doctor can do some assessment without being with you, right? Uh, also, for surgery, assisted surgery, or you know, you have a hospital or you have a doctor in some remote location, and the doctor needs some assistance or needs some help or expertise. Then, from the big hospital in a big city, there is you know video and uh, audio communication channels that allow this kind of a uh, health help to to be to be available in the remote locations. And then the p-health is personalized health. So this one is about wearables and about uh, making the healthcare more personalized, okay? So normally, again, it's kind of a complicated topic. So um, normally you have some general guidelines and general prescriptions for the whole population, right? Um, so you say, uh, if you have such and such symptoms, majority of the population have that disease or that problem, therefore that's your, you know, um, that's the kind of resulting um, diagnosis, right? Uh, but 
if you using only those kind of generalized uh, approximations, you will be wrong fraction of the time. Sometimes that fraction is very small, sometimes that fraction is quite big because the va variance in the population is quite big, right? So if you have flu-like symptoms, you might have flu, but if you have a certain history of certain diseases, your symptoms may look like flu, but you may actually have something else. And if you're being considered in a kind of a general population, the diagnosis will be, okay, that's flu, right? But if you consider in the history of your own diseases, then it may be that it's clear that it's not flu, it's something else, right? But to do that, we have to have sort of a knowledge and histories per individual. And PHELV is kind of trying to achieve that. You can kind of uh, have your personalized track record of different things that happened to you, of your hereditary traits from your ancestors and so on. And then the doctor analyzing your kind of case instead of taking knowledge from those generalized uh, knowledge bases that we have about the populations, it's kind of doing it on per individual basis and then may have much more accurate uh, prediction of what works and what doesn't. You know, it, it doesn't mean we don't do it now, neither. I mean, we are. Like if, um, like my, my father, for example, is, um, he cannot take aspirin because then it thins his blood too much and he has problems. Uh, so it's kind of a known case. It's kind of specific for him, but not really just for one person in the world. Like there is a group of people who are, you know, um, allergic to aspirin and they cannot take it, right? So doctors know that, that case, right? Uh, but they might be, those groupings might be smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So you might be kind of individual uh, because of your genetic makeup and your kind of uh, disease history, it might be kind of helpful for doctors to know that. So PHELV is trying to analyze how we can bring technology to make it possible, right? Uh, so all the health records, um, uh, mobile health or PHELV topics are definitely there. So we can say sort of... Uh, health in general and then again we can have you know uh, wearables and we can have um, security right or privacy uh, as a subtopics so you see we already can have multiple taxonomies right we can put health under wearables uh, here right or we can put focus on health in the context of wearables, right? So it's sort of, uh, we, we, it's not clear, right? If you're doing a proper taxonomy, you kind of define like a Venn diagram kind of thing where things are kind of self-contained. Here, it's a little bit messy, but it kind of gives us the, uh, the angle, right? So for example, if you're talking about health, um, then you can dive more into the usage of wearables, but your focus is on health. If you're talking about wearables, you can use health as an example domain, but you're not focusing on health, you're focusing on the wearables, right? Uh, so for example, if, if we do, uh, I don't know, let's say activity tracking, activity tracking, then we are focusing on technology which supports activity tracking. It can be for sport, it can be for health, it can be for anything, right? Whereas if we did here activity tracking, it's with a specific purpose for health, right? So, what else? Yeah? Can you repeat that? So, targeted for what? I'm thinking about yeah, okay, okay, yep. So that's, let's put it a bit more up. It's more technology centric. So, um, would, yeah, it's a good point. What would be the, the umbrella category for that? What would be something that this became kind of a part of? Yeah, so uh, let's say platforms and then say um, um, 
right? So that, that those are sort of keywords. Um, and then you have other topics related to that. Would that be correct? Yeah. yeah. Platforms for mobile Internet of Things, cloud, you know, in general, platforms. Yep. That's memory usage. So, like, how, like, the Facebook app is it's same issues. I'm saying that, like, the LinkedIn app, there, like, there's, I don't see a reason for being yep. you know, as big as they are, seeing as the programs should actually be relatively simplistic. Yep. So, we could have. It, this this one is a good one. Uh, we could have it under some scalability and performance issues, right? Or we could have something which we can call uh, limited resources computing and look into the memory usage from that point of view, right? Yeah. And in the uh, Facebook app point of view, it's not really a limited resource device because you have a lot of RAM and, and so on on your mobile but the problems are kind of similar to the ones which you could, for example, use for IoT, right? Um, so I would kind of put it under both. Um, you can even have that topic being dealt under the, uh, the memory, under the energy management from, from that point of view as well, right? So the memory usage is kind of spanning multiple things. It, it, and in itself, it could be sort of a top level one, right? But we can retrofit it under uh, limited resource computing, scalability and performance, or battery. Um, the, yeah, we discussed it yesterday in the mobile course, right? Because I said that um, you know on the Android or uh, iOS platform, the operating system is doing life cycle based on the what is happening with the device, right? I don't actually have my mobile here, but let's say this is a mobile phone, right? So if I have an activity on the, on the front screen, which I'm using, let's say a game, and I, I, I stopped it and I, I put it into a background and now I have a different activity on front, right? So the operating system is seeing, okay, there is a game in the background which is currently not being run, it's paused, uh, the user is not using it, the user was not using it for an hour, so we will just uh, wipe it, right? We, we just kill it from memory, right? And the, the, when the user picks it to be loaded again, we will have to redo it from scratch, right? We will have to allocate all the resources, all the assets, and, and so on, right? Uh, so why would the operating system do that? Well, the operating system may do that because it's running out of RAM, right? The, the front running application needs more RAM, and it has to re release some of the resources which are currently not used. So it says, okay, that app goes, right? Uh, but the operating system can also do it because stuff that is kept in the RAM is using battery, right? So there was a question, okay, how much effect it has to have, let's say, you know, eight gig of RAM being all utilized and having only one gig of RAM being utilized and the rest being free, right, on the memory consumption. And it's a kind of a valid question, right? And you can investigate that. You can have an experiment and measure how much more you're draining the battery if you're occupying all eight gig of RAM, and how much you're draining if you're only occupying one gig, and you can kind of turn off the, the chips which are not being used, right? Um, can you do that on the mobile platform, right? You can check, okay, what are the hard hardware capabilities? For example, on the high performance computing, um, most systems are able to turn off the particular dims of RAM that you have on the motherboard, right? Why do you think they are able to do that? So you have a rack, you've mounted a server, it has, I don't know, 128 gig of RAM, it has 24 slots with the dims being put there, and the BIOS can turn off power to any of the slots at, at will, like you can program it so to, you can tell the operating system to turn off the power to particular RAM. Why would you have that? Save electricity. Um, yeah. Save electricity, that's... Uh, uh, generation? Say it again? Generation? 
So uh, save electricity and heat. Those are good points, but the, those are not why we have that, why we actually have that. So they are used for saving energy now, and they are used for saving, you know, um, if they are not used, you, know, you can turn them off. But why we have it in the first place? Why we had that in the first place? What would you think? What was the reason why we designed system to be able to do that? We did that in the era where we didn't care about the heat and energy yet that much. I mean, we cared, but... The thing is, it's less, it's less thing to care about, so have your spacing and stuff? Yeah, I think kind of um, more fundamentally. So if I have a, a server, let's say, you know, telecom server running in some sort of a distribution center. It's deployed. What can go wrong? Faults can happen, right? So, you know, RAM can become faulty and it will need to be replaced, right? So then what would I do? I, do I shut down the server? Well, <laughs> I don't want to do that. I don't want to shut down the server, right? So yes, so I basically will turn off the RAM which is faulty, remove it, put the new one in, and turn it on again, right? While the system continues to run as before, right? I, I'm not shutting down the system, right? So the, those sort of uh, rack mountable servers, they are kind of a marvel of technology to run forever, <laughs> right? They usually have redundant power supplies, so you have multiple power supplies on a single server. So if one fails, it automatically switches to the one to the one which is not faulty, and you can replace the one which is faulty, right? They usually have redundant uh, CPU units. So not only multi-core, but you have multiple CPUs, right? So if one of the modules becomes faulty, one is continually to run, you replace the one which is faulty. RAM, it's the same, right? Um, because you have multiple power supplies, it's really cool because, uh, you know, if, if I have uh, a rack or a server plugged into this power point here, right, uh, then I can kind of uh, plug it to, to this one with the other one, unplug that one, and kind of walk with it, right? So I can keep it running and walk across building, right? And it, it, it never shuts down because I can keep it you know, unplugging it and plugging it, right? You cannot do it with your home PC because you have only one power tra uh, transformer, right? Um, so we did that. <laughs> so we had to move, you know, our rack from one office to the other without shutting it down, and we just did that, right? <laughs> um, so why you do that? Well, you have all those user level agreements, right? If you, if you say, I'm guaranteeing 99.999% of run uptime, well, you know, it's really hard to do that if you don't have all those me measures in, right? Because bad things happen. So the main reason here is redundancy, right? So we have uh, ability to turn off the, the RAM uh, because we want to be able to replace it on the fly while the system is running. Um, okay, so why we got sidetracked to this? <laughs> what was your original question? Yeah, memory usage. So I was thinking of it more like negatively, like why is everyone just wasting it away? Yeah. Um, like the Facebook, for instance, the Facebook app, how could it need to be like 500 megs or whatever? And same with the mm -hmm. LinkedIn app, was insanely huge. And like basically what you're actually doing is just reading a bunch of stuff on file. Yeah. Same with Twitter, that's basically just like a file being attended to all the time. Why is that so big? Yeah, so what I would say, uh, what we could do is we could have a category. Um, so we could um, we could put it really under like a software development practices in the context of mobile cloud IoT and so on, right? 
so you know I don't know why this particle app is that wasteful but what usually happens is you know you are a big company and you sort of are doing something for a particular business case right and whether you're using more RAM or less RAM is irrelevant to you yeah. and it's cheaper for you to use something crappy that uses more RAM because it's just cheaper for you to do that right yeah. so for example you're developing a game uh, and you have I don't know two gig of assets right and you, you're just doing it okay but if you optimize your assets, if you kind of cut them into like atlases and so on, you could maybe minimize it to 1.6, okay? Uh, but it would cost you a month of development. Would you do that? Well, you wouldn't, right? Why would you do that? Why would you pay extra month or two months of work for no business value, right? If it doesn't translate into a business value, you don't do that, right? Yeah, but even if it plays a really fast business value, it goes through. I mean, as a student, generates what? Files when they create an empty project. Yes, that's true. Yeah, that's broken. So, yeah, <laughs> we, we can investigate it under that umbrella, right? <laughs> so, th this is a valid point. I don't know, right, all the answers. And there are reasons which might be trivial, might be sloppiness or, you know, bad practices which can be improved. So, I don't know, right? It's good. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Yes, very good. We also had it last year. Uh, so this is a very good topic. Um, monetization and business models. Business models. Okay. I saw a really interesting article about that, which talked about uh, a company that was their sort of marketing team was that instead of showing user or instead of monetizing your um, users with advertisements mm -hmm. you would monetize them that while well, your application was in the background you would like be doing data mining <laughs> on like bitcoins etc so now you're draining the battery life instead <laughs> that's right <laughs> yeah that's true um so there are different different ways of monetizing right uh one weird one i've heard on the conference uh on web summit was uh you know, you have, most of you have uh, free plans for text messages, right? You can ha have unlimited, like some don't, but some do, right? I don't, but some people have this unlimited plan for text messages, right? So how about you sell it <laughs> to somebody else who would use your account to push, you know, advertisements <laughs> to people, to your friends, right? So you have a free resource, which is an unlimited SMSs. Somebody needs a resource to push SMSs through, you just sell it, right? You you benefit from it. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, but that that is good, and there is you know that that's um, a subtopic which we had was in the context of games. Uh, some of it may go into the you know Simon's uh, course, right? If it's like. Um, game specific um, but it can be discussed in this course too uh, so monetization business models especially if it's sort of in between cloud or multi-platform kind of thing that is where this course fits in like if you a lot of uh, game studios are kind of doing that right it's sort of called uh, cross-media campaigns right so you know you have uh, uh, you know you, you have Frozen the movie right, but you also have the song comes with the movie because in the radio you cannot show the movie But you can play the song which kind of co you know makes people remember about the movie then you have uh, You know a game, you know Stupid or not stupid re Related to the movie right and then you have some merchandise where you're actually making a lot of profits on right so you kind of building this sort of uh, um, Cross media enterprise which tries to target different um, different groups for different purposes right because why do they have merchandise it's for the grandma to buy a toy for their granddaughter right uh, so the the merchandise sometimes is targeting the grandparents right 
the game is not for the grandparents and the grandparents don't care about the movie that much or the song but they care about the doll right because they can buy it as a gift right so you know they they try to monetize on the idea or on the ip across multiple um yeah media you know so we see that more and more it becomes kind of a platform right you very rarely have just a movie or just a game right you have all the things kind of bundled up because they they have some sort of value and they're trying to see okay how we can get money from the kids from their parents from their grandparents and blah 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 right but that's also because you're not selling so like the one product and where you're selling it from stuff that's right exactly exactly so we, we we see that transition as well right it used to be that business models were all about the product but the kind of these days you're trying to make uh, the product being something very intangible it's an idea or an intellectual property or a brand right uh, so like you know the value of apple is not in the hardware or software it's the the value of apple is in the brand which they've built right um, and that's what you pay for i i, I mean I'm, I'm not saying you you paying for it but the, the people who buy the equipment right um, so and what is a brand well you know what is it like it's something that doesn't exist it's very ephemeral right you may say well it is kind of a proxy to quality or a proxy to safety or proxy to something but it's a very bad proxy in most cases it's not right um so it's so it's written like it's a mix i would say it's sort of like an experience mm -hmm. so sort of like how um um with, well, what, um, what's the really cheap flying company again forget the Ryanair. yeah right there yeah they would actually design their web pages to be you know really shit when ordering your tickets just because then you felt that like you worked to get a really low price <laughs> Yeah. So their like their pages was designed to be shit yeah. from a year perspective. Like it would like you, it would be hard to figure out where you were supposed to go on the page, and how to order tickets, and how much can you actually bring, etc. All of those were so that you know you felt that you had figured it out and sort of solved the puzzle, and therefore you you know you um, deserved getting yeah. the cheap prices. Yeah. Complicated. I also feel they doing it a little bit too obscure of what you're actually paying for. Yeah. So it's kind of unclear, like you go to a normal airline and they say, oh yeah, you're paying that much, right? But here you, they say, oh yeah, you're paying that much. Oh yeah, you want the luggage. Well, now you're paying that much. Oh, you want this, you, you're paying that much, right? So that, it, it's this sort of diversification by obscurity a little bit as well. Um, yeah, but it's, you know, that's, you know, monetization and business models definitely fit in. Um, how about uh, sort of like, being open to different label people, so like usability, displaying text, displaying text. Yeah, thing. so that's Isn't that regulation coming in on that now. That like certain apps, etc., have to be approachable from people with the, for people with different. Um, yeah. It's also universal. Um, universal design. Yeah. Yeah. So that that is a kind of a uh, an interesting topic as well, right? Uh, so universal. Design and uh, mobiles have that guideline as well. So you know, you when you're developing a mobile app, for example, you have Google and Apple telling you what to do, so then blind people can use it if, if, if it is possible for, to use that particular app. Like I mean, if, if it's a computer game, um, you know, maybe the blind people cannot play, really play it, right? But if it's a utility app, you know, buying tickets or something then maybe the blind people can use it. They just need to hear what the labels are for certain buttons and certain things, right? So you can add that in. And it's the same with people with limited uh, sight or with hearing disability, right? So if you're relying on some notifications being uh, audible, uh, audible um, pop-ups, then maybe you have to do it visually, right? So th th there is, of course, there are guidelines. And in Norway, they are trying to force websites and web applications to follow the guidelines under the universal design such that uh, a wide range of people you know colorblind deaf uh, blind can kind of use the public services right which makes perfect sense 
Like if you're doing something for general population, of course you should target everybody, right? But when you're developing a game, should you really focus off the game being playable by a blind person? And it's like, no. But you can no. Like not mix red and green. Exactly. The, uh, exactly. So if you're yeah. developing a game, maybe you can make it more playable by a color blind, right? Um, the question though is, like, if you a commercial company doing something, right? Um, so you you see that with games. Okay, there is a big studio, they have a game, right? All the games, um, not all the games are localized to Norwegian, right? Norwegian is like 4 million people. To localize something properly, you have to spend a budget. And the company is saying, okay, should we really localize it to Norwegian? Or is the cost not worth the value which we will have from the Norwegian population? Because if we do that, how much we will increase the, uh, the number of players? Right, and the answer is almost no, nothing because the Norwegian population is so well equipped in English that they will use the English version if there is no Norwegian version. It will not stop them playing the game, right? Yeah, we'll so, the yeah exactly. So then, you know, the question, and, and similar question is here, right? If I'm a commercial developer and I'm developing a game, uh, I have to make an effort to make it playable by colorblind people. How many players will I have? Is it worth doing it, right? I mean, apart from the ethical decision, there is also the business decision. And often the business decision trump the ethical decisions and saying, well, okay, we're gonna screw the colorblind people, right? Um, unfortunately, right? Because it's too costly. If it's the public service, that's the answer is clear, okay? You are trying to do a service for your general population, it has to be accessible by general population. But if you're doing a commercial product, it's a little bit harder to um, to enforce those rules, right? You could add it as DLC, DLC, or you could drop it in the process. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. So I don't know. I don't know like what the answer is. I mean, the uh, there is this big movement for universal design, but. Um, yeah, so I, I personally feel sometimes it's broken if you do it this way, okay? So th there are two ways of doing this. Um, so one way is, so you have, uh, you, you, so you have some sort of idea or something that will turn up to be a product, okay? And here you have your population. And the population is kind of, uh, let's say, grouped into some disabilities or whatever, right? And now the proponents of universal design are trying to do is to say, well, you should sort of follow a process that tries to have something uniform for all of those, right? Yeah, it doesn't work very well. But by the very definition of doing that, this is suboptimal, right? Um, if you make, not, not always, right? But most of the time it is, right? If you make something um, usable by colorblind people and normal vision people, then the normal vision people may say, well, you know, we could have this red thing here which would appeal to us more, right? So it is kind of suboptimal, right? So the alternative model is you don't do that. Uh, you say, okay, you try to target the groups and kind of uh, uh, localize it per group, right? So for the colorblind, you really have the, a proper colorblind version. For the normal vision people, you have the version which they really appreciate, right? Um, which one is harder? Is the previous model cheaper or better than this one? I don't know. I mean, sometimes it isn't, right? Uh, sometimes this model is better, right? So, blind, um, you know, pushing a universal design for everything always, I don't think that's the, the, the good way of doing it, right? If I have to have something that is being accessible by blind and deaf, right, people, I really have to think differently for those two groups of users, right? I cannot make a universal design app for both of those groups. For the blind, I really have to focus on audio and the kind of the audio interface. For the deaf, you know, there is no audio, it's all visual, right? Um, so, you know, universal design is not a solution for everything. It, it's a good practice sometimes, and for like web apps, it might be a, a way to do it, uh, but yeah. So instead of saying universal, Say like design for different labels or whatever the 
Yeah. So maybe differentiated design yeah. designs, right? Yeah. 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 Good. What else? Let's put one more. What else do you think? Yeah. So would would you feel the ethics is the top level or like for example ethics is part of oh whoops sorry is part of the business models could be. You could also sort of add in one more and say how do you like optimize for how do you get as many children as possible. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you That's could use right. ethics and the reverse of ethics yeah. to, to, to do that, right? So it is relevant to business models and monetization for sure. Um, you could have um, ethics dealt here as well, um, because, you know, what is the ethical disclosure or ethical hacking, right? Uh, you could deal with that. Yeah. Where would you fit? Augmented reality. If you were to put a paper about augmented reality, which category that would fit? Could fit into all, right? Um, but if you were to talk about it from the technology point of view. But if you... Yeah. Yeah? That's what I feel is most challenging with making anything for... Okay, that's fine. Drones? It's going to be difficult. <laughs> because that's actually an important platform. We uh, have, uh, over the summer, we had our job, we had um, uh, a visit from uh, some uh, drone guys. I, don't, I think it was Crystal Dynamics or something that they're called. They're making these drones that are like this documentary, so that are this small and weigh like less than three grams. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite insane. I mean, like you can't see them from the distance. So we would they would like start them up and uh, like hover right in front of us, and then we would like five meters away and like two meters or five meters away and like two feet up or something. Mm -hmm. and you can see it anymore, and you can hear it. Mm -hmm. And like that's you know that's, scary. That's challenging <laughs> <laughs> and for scalability and performance and limited resources, etc. Yeah, yeah. So that fits. Uh, so that's good. That means our list is kind of good so far, right? Um, games, well, again, depends, right? Uh, it can fit in one of those technology topics or maybe monetization, right? Um, blockchain can fit under scalability, uh, definitely. Do you know about Ethereum, like the computing platform, universal computing platform? Where would it fit? No, that, that just a, as a computing platform. Instead of using like you know Amazon and deploying something there, you actually deploy your smart contract on the Ethereum, right? So, or IPFS as a sort of a distributed storage, right? Um, so maybe we put that. So you could look into blockchains from scalability and performance point of view, but you could look. Oops, you could look in, into them like a blockchain distributed ledger, a global computing platform like Ethereum or IPFS. Do you know what IPFS is? Uh, so IPFS, it's like Google Drive, but done by people who are like torrent nodes. Okay, so you run a piece of software and you become a part of a distributed global disk space where nobody can delete things, but everybody can put stuff in, right? 
and you only host what you uh, what you want to host like from your own end right so if you put a file in there the file will be hashed the hash is going to be distributed around and if anybody else needs that file they will make a copy of that file on their local computer and they will become a duplicate version of the file that you have so it's uh non-changeable it's sort of like git because uh, you have everything versioned by the hash of the content, right? So let's say you want to use it for file sharing, right? You have a movie, um, you know, you recorded some uh, movie on GoPro and you want to share it with friends, right? What you can do? Well, you can use YouTube or you can put it on uh, Google Drive and then share it, but those are proprietary platforms, right? This one is not owned by anybody, right? Uh, and it's not, it's censorship resistant it's free and it's you know available right so what you do is you you put the file on your local drive and you give a hash to your friend and the friend using ipfs says i want to see that 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 movie so he says okay i want the the file with that hash so then the network finds where is the nearest nodes which have that that file and kind of transmit that file to him right and if you're using a uh, LAN, like if you give it to somebody here in this room, the file from your laptop will be directly transmitted to another machine, peer-to-peer, -peer, right? So you don't have to go through central server, like in Google case, uh, but it's kind of peer-to-peer. -peer. And then if you have a copy and he has the copy and somebody else needs it, then you have already two nodes which can share it, right? So for content delivery, it kind of makes things much more streamlined and it balances itself, right? So the first person who gets it in US becomes kind of a node for the local environment and other people can get it locally from us right uh, they don't have to get it from you anymore uh, and the guarantee that they're getting a proper content is because it's always hashed right so you can check okay I i'm getting the legitimate content right so you can use it for file sharing you can use it for web apps like currently if you want to have a web app you have to develop a client site and you have to host it somewhere. You need to have some sort of server which serves that client side app, right? So who runs that node? Well, you can use it on Amazon or whatever, or you can use it on your laptop, but you, you kind of a bottleneck, right? If you put it into the IPFS, suddenly anybody who wants the copy becomes a kind of a delivery network, right? So it, it is kind of like a torrent, right? How does that work with uh, sort of piracy issues? Yeah, it works very well with piracy issues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like since now you're sort of like you're not just downloading stuff, you're uh, you're like helping others. Well, I guess you already did that with torrent technology. Yeah, you did that with torrent, and you don't. But can you choose not to do that? Perhaps? Yes, you can yeah. choose not to do that, right? And you can also do that with IPFS. So you can, you can choose to just download and not be like a relay, or. Well, if you downloaded it, you became a relay. But if you haven't downloaded it, you know the relay for things you don't want to yeah. relay. So that means that if you download something, you're also sort of basically also okay with sort of sharing that up. So if you're that's right. If you're downloading pirated music, then you also sort of become an uploader of that pirated music. That's correct. Yeah. Unless you decide, okay, I'm opting out, and you delete it. Yeah. So once you because it's sort of like Google Drive, what yeah. you have there is shared. If you delete it from your local copy, you're not sharing it anymore, right? Uh, so it's up to you. So you can sort of opt out, even if you downloaded something, to kind of delete it. But what you have in the IPFS drive is sort of, you become a relay for it. Uh, they have a, a privacy layer. So you may not know what you are relaying as well, right? In which case, you may be relaying things that you don't download it per se and you are not liable for illegal things because you don't know what it is. It's all encrypted. Right, um, so you you may have a layer which sort of obfuscates of what people are relaying to a point where nobody knows, right? Um, which begs ethical questions and legal questions, and it's kind of really interesting from a legal point of view because you know you may have content which is perfectly legal in Norway, right? You may have content about Chinese government which you can host and it's perfectly legal here. It's illegal in China, right? So then what happens, you know? Nothing happens, right? Because you're free to do that. You're not breaking any Norwegian laws and you're doing it. And then all Chinese people can access it, but they are not relaying it. So, you know, it, it kind of uh, 
sort of is legal to do something that is illegal in some jurisdiction, right? And there is no way for the Chinese governments to force everybody in the world to delete something that is illegal only in China, right? Um, so there is no kind of a global uh, jurisdiction control. So that's an interesting case. The other interesting case is, okay, pedophiles can use it to um, exchange materials, right? So then you feel, you may feel, okay, I don't want to be part of that, right? But how would you stop that, right? Um, we don't know yet, right? There is no mechanisms to, to stop that. Or, you know, um, law enforcement say, okay, these particular files are illegal right, for whatever reasons, right? Maybe pedophiles or whatever, right? Then maybe there is a mechanism for uh, having like a blacklist and you can opt in to have your client remove all the content that is blacklisted. So it's a form of censorship, right? You have kind of a list of censored materials and you may opt in to say, I don't want to be relaying anything which is on that list, right? Um, but th that's not implemented yet, right? So that, you know, that, uh, there are discussions about how, um, how to deal with cases like this, okay? But it's a kind of a, an interesting topic in the distributed computing space, right? Okay, uh, so I think we are more or less bulletproof in terms of topics, right? So now what we need is we need some challenging positions about things within those topics, right? So we need some concepts or ideas saying, I want to talk about, let's say IPFS and kind of uh, discuss pros and cons of, of certain things. So I want to discuss performance on mobile apps, why they consuming so much battery, right? And do some investigations, right? So we need some topics, but we cannot discuss them in a void. We need sort of evidence supporting things, right? So let's say PMS wants to discuss the memory usage on mobile apps and why the Twitter and Facebook apps are so big, right? But he needs to find some evidence or some papers discussing it. Otherwise, you know, you can't really do a case, right? So I will like, you all for next week to think what would be the three topics that you would like to discuss and find some papers where you put those papers under the headings for the stuff that we have on the wiki, right? So I will save it. Um, I will say um, global topic list. If you came up with something that is not on the list, right? So you say, oh yeah, I would like to discuss this. And it sort of doesn't fit under any of those categories. Just add a category, okay? Make, make things up. And then add papers as bullet points under the categories. Uh, and you can change your mind, right? You don't have to lock yourself to a particular topic or lock yourself to a particular idea that you want to discuss you can change your mind after you read one or two papers, right? So PMS wants to do, let, uh, just for sake of argument, wants to do this memory thing. He reads two papers and says, actually, I don't want to do this memory thing anymore, right? That's fine. So we will have the papers here and he picks something else, okay? What we will have next week is a list of papers for different topics that people can read, right? I expect you to read, um, you know, at least two, three papers per topic that you will discuss, which means if you are discussing three topics, you have to read, you know, 10 papers, okay? Um, and then when you're counter-arguing or referring somebody else's work and it's not overlapping with yours, you have to read some papers from that other work as well, right? So in total, you might read about 15 papers for the course, okay? Which is similar to the game course. In the game course, you will be given papers to read each week uh, we, I don't remember, we have about 12 weeks or something like this. Uh, so we will read about 12, 15 papers for the game course to those of you who are doing both. Uh, here it's similar, right? Uh, some of the papers which we use uh, are not very long scientific papers. Some are just sort of well-structured blog posts because I will put some papers under those topics too, right? especially the ones which I want um, to demonstrate some of the faults of wrong argumentation, right? So if you read a little bit more papers in this course, that's fine because they generally a little bit shorter than the ones in the game. Um, but what will happen is 
next week we're gonna discuss the the papers right uh, no no we're not gonna discuss the papers we'll have the papers we're gonna discuss the topics okay because uh, formulating a topic is one of the challenges which we will address in this course right so we will spend the lecture uh, not, not the whole lecture but a little bit of time me discussing what is a good or bad topic and we will have a discussion about it okay and we will have a list of papers that uh, people can see and read okay uh, so you can start sort of making your mind okay I would like to discuss this this and this and I need to read a little bit of about those topics and then you will formulate the topic um, and we will kind of before you start writing about it we will refine the topic itself okay what can go wrong with the topic why the topic is good or why the topic is bad uh, why it's what is a well formulated one and what is sort of a ill formulated one okay so we'll spend some time discussing the topics for next week so bring in your head the topics that you might want to put forward um, so if each of you will make three topics um, so we have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so we will have 30 topics in general right um, it's a lot so what we may do we, we may have more than one person doing the same topic right because then it's sort of a uh, less um, yeah it, it, yeah I, I will talk about the logistics next week right because we have to have this kind of big matrix of topics the essays that everybody will do for and then people have to be mapped to reviews and to counter arguments right if we have 30 topics in, in general and only 10 people then the you know the matrix is not it's quite sparse right so there will be holes so we have to make the matrix kind of as dense as possible so then we have a small number of holes right because if you have a topic and nobody reviewed it that you will feel ah, uh, you know it sucks a little bit so um, it's kind of good if 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 the matrix is kind of uh, more condensed so we, we will do it next week um, so you know what to do papers so how do you search for papers Google Scholar what else yeah you, you can use Google as well right so you can use Google Scholar for papers but you can also use Google to get some sort of a feel of the terms to be used and who are the people working in it you can use Google to find some labs which lead you to people web pages with a lot of papers uh, so you can do it this way there is a lab, there is a lot of library resources for web of science and and kind of indexing databases where you can do searches on papers as well uh, very good is to do a reverse search on the references of the paper that you found right let's say you go to Google Scholar and you found one paper it will usually have about 30 references at the back that's great right check them right check if some titles or some of the content of the paper interests you so then you can go to the paper from the references right um, you can also notice that if you have a paper with references you can see proceedings of a conference right that's great go to a web page of that conference and you will have a list of other people being in that conference and discussing things right so let's say you want to do something with UI uh, you found one paper about mobile UI you go to the back to the references and you see a number of references citing a uh, you know Kai conference right great so go go there check what uh, what they are doing um, yeah you know that, that this one Kai conferences for user uh, computer human interaction is the the most um, prestigious kind of uh, conference in the UI UX space um, why you have to do this why I'm forcing you to do that instead of like Simon giving you the papers well it's again it's a skill that will come really handy when you're writing your master thesis right when you have your master topic and you're writing your master thesis nobody is gonna give you the list of papers and you will have to have probably about 70 or 100 right out of which you will select about 30 40 50 for your references for the thesis right it's a lot of work and 
you know, if you're doing it for the first time for your master thesis, that's that's not too good. Uh, you will see some shortcuts and some techniques here that you can then reuse, okay? And we will share uh, how people are finding. I can tell you how I'm finding papers, but you can tell me how you're finding it, and maybe we can learn from each other, right? Um, okay, how many papers should you find? Well, that's tricky, okay? Uh, so the rule of thumb is that if you have three valuable good papers per essay, that's fine. So no, not more than three, okay? Sometimes two is enough, okay? But how do you get those three? Uh, that, that's, you know, um, that's tricky, right? Sometimes you are lucky and you find four or five papers out of which three are great and you use those three, right? But sometimes you have to find like two or three out of which you find some references and you kind of do like a depth search and then you get to something that is really good, right? Um, there is no, um, there is no kind of algorithm. There, there are some heuristics, right? So read the abstract. If the abstract sounds relevant, continue. If the abstract doesn't sound relevant, stop, right? The, you know, try something else. Uh, of, of course, you're starting with the title, right? But sometimes title is not enough. Sometimes you do have to read an abstract, okay? Uh, the title may not sound relevant or may sound relevant, but it's not, but you know, it's better just to read an abstract. Abstract is usually a paragraph. It's not a lot of effort. You know, it will take you a minute or two and you will know, okay? Is it worth reading the paper or not? Um, if the paper is, is written by the author that you know is relevant for your work, if there is someone doing work in memory management and he publishes something, reading the title may not tell you, but reading the abstract will tell you, and then you can be biased in favor of somebody that you know, right? So if it's someone you don't know, then be more critical, more skeptical, but if it's someone you know, then maybe it's worth reading that paper anyway. Maybe the paper is relevant, maybe not, but reading a paper is probably worth your time, okay? Uh, there is literally millions of papers. There is not possible for you to read uh, even a substantial chunk of it, right? You will not be able to search the space by reading stuff very exhaustively. You have to be quite smart in picking what you read and what you don't read, right? Um, Again, it, it's a skill and it's not um, something that I can tell you, okay, do it this way and it will always work. It's, um, it's very tricky to, uh, to do that. Uh, and you will have to be doing it for a while for your master thesis, right? So here, don't go overboard, right? Um, I would say if you spend um, more than like 45 minutes on a topic to find the relevant papers, uh, then you probably reached your limit, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean that, so that 45 minutes is to, to pre-select a list of say five or six papers that you're gonna read. And then out of that, you will read the papers and pick two or three, okay? Uh, don't make the pre-selection list very long. Make, make it sort of five maybe, okay? Uh, and then you don't have to read all five papers, but you have to pick three out of the five. So, which papers do we want to be listed here? Uh, I would like the papers that you think are very likely to be helpful, right? Uh, so, should be only the papers you've read? Yes, all the papers you've read and you think are valuable should be here, but you can also put a paper that you almost read <laughs> You, you read halfway through and you still think it's valuable, then put it here, right? So if you haven't completely read the whole paper, but you really are convinced that it is a relevant paper, put it here, right? But if you just read an abstract and you don't know, then don't, don't, don't put it here, right? Uh, because that means, you know, there is extra work people would have to do. It's like 10 people would have to do the work than one person could do, right? We want the kind of go, no go decision. So if you decide, yeah, it's a, it's a good paper, it's a relevant paper, then you put it here, okay? If you find a particularly bad paper, right? If you find a paper that you see, oh, come on, you know, you cannot do this, right? Put it here as well, <laughs> okay? That, those are kind of fun to, to use sometimes, especially if you're doing a counter-argument, okay? Or, or something like this, right? Um, all right, so any questions? 
So you clear about the, the course? So the course is sort of, um, we, we're doing peer review as well, right? So you will be reviewing each other's work, the, the, each other's essays by doing those two reviews and counter. Um, so the, the six things that you write will create a portfolio. And then you're gonna get a grade from that portfolio, plus there will be an oral exam at the end of the course, right? Um, the, um, the, the grades are not peer given, so you will not grade each other, but you will kind of uh, mark each other, right? So you, you're doing kind of a pre-grading, right? And we use that as a guideline as well uh, for, for final portfolio marking. Um, can you fix things? Can you write your essay again? Well, we don't have time, right? So unfortunately, we have a limited time to do that. But what will happen is you will write your first essay first, then you will write some of the reviews and counters, and then you will get the feedback, and then you will do the second one and third one, right? So by the time you're doing your third one, you've already got a lot of feedback, right? So even though you may have done some things wrong for the first essay or first reviews, by the time you're doing your third one, you, you know, and we see that, right? We see people doing first, second, and the third is usually really good, right? Uh, so the grade is kind of for the third one, right? Uh, I'm not biased or I'm not really uniform. I'm actually grading you of what you've learned. So I'm kind of grading you on the last ones more. It doesn't mean you should make the first one shit, right? Uh, try to do your best, okay? But it's usually a progression. And, and we've seen it last year with students that the third essays were really much more improved and better than the first essays, right? Um, it's a natural kind of progression. So I think it's, it's kind of, it's, it's working fine. Um, right, if you have any questions or any issues, use the issue tracker. So uh, we are having the wiki here, but we also have an issue tracker. Uh, so if you have questions or comments or suggestions, use it. Uh, I will use the announcements through Blackboard, but apart from announcements, I'm not gonna use Blackboard for anything in that course. Uh, we did try to use Blackboard last semester, and it's uh, very, yeah, it's hard, hard to use it uh, effectively. Uh, so we we think just using Wiki and Issue Tracker in this course will be fine. We will have another tool for doing those essays. So I will show you the the tool once I integrate the uh, the module which some of the students did last semester. I I still haven't done that, uh, and we use the tool to exchange the comments and the, the essays. The essays are just pure text, right? Uh, sometimes we have a question, okay, should I use some graphics, uh, some diagram for my essay? The answer is yes, you can do it if you want, but then you have to like link a PDF to your, to the essay text because we don't have um, embeddable graphics in the tool. We, it's sort of really a discussion type of thing, right? Uh, so if you really want to include some graphics, you can do that, but then attach a PDF to the, text that you put on the on the essay. We have Markdown, uh, so you can format your document the way you want using Markdown, but uh, no graphics. Is it a limitation? I don't think so, because the whole point here is about ver um, written argumentation, right? You can do argumenting by designing something, like saying, okay, this UI is better than that, and it's really hard to do in words, right? Then, of course, use graphics. If we have Markdown, Yeah, you can have links to images, yes, that's right. So you can basically do that. You can embed like a figure, which is an external um, image. Yeah, that's fine. Um, what else about this? Don't abuse the system. You know, the system is not bulletproof. It has vulnerabilities. So try not to, uh, you know, destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And also the, the wiki and everything here is quite open, right? So if somebody asks a question and you know the answer, just answer them. Uh, you know, it's fine. It's for everybody to use. We kind of a group. Uh, it's not just me versus you kind of thing. Uh, if you have, you know, something to modify or add to the wiki, do that as well. Um, 